Are the Sarbanes-Oxley compliance standards really helping companies to operate more effectively? Well, when we talk about reserves and production numbers, we're really talking about data. Do we have the technology to track all the diverse inputs that are involved? The only technology that we could get to look at the data would be, would be uh, our armies marching in and kicking in the vaults and stealing the data and then using a photocopy machine to get the data. And there, there, are, there are some, and I'll have to say I remember several times in the last couple of years listening on television to Cambridge Research Associates executives that would talk about GPS satellite systems that would fly around the world and manage oil fields. And say, I, th I thought at first they were talking about spy satellites that would peer through walls and see the production history. No, they weren't. It was another concept. Well, I always thought I was colorful until I met Matt, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I actually agree with him on his core premise, which is I think the most important thing for an investor to know about is the production history. Wouldn't it be, have been nice to have known the production history field by field of the top two or three hundred fields in the world so we would have been able to have lead time of knowing the oil probably peaked two years ago? And as long as the industry said, we don't need to know that, and in fact, it's my data I don't want to show, it left us in the dark. The most important data you have is what has the property done in the past. That's going to be one of the best predictors of how the property is going to perform in the future. And the more information that people have regarding that information, the production history, and the availability to that, I think the, the better and wiser decisions that can be made on investing. You know, the idea of reserve auditing, somebody coming in and actually looking at the process. Reserves are not audited today. I mean, you know, probably 70% of the value of our integrated companies, you know, result of the reserve position. Yet we don't even audit those. So I think there's a bit more that could be done there. I don't think it's a technology question per se. I, I hope that they don't bring in a third party to start auditing reserves. I, I guess uh, I have a, enough difficulty with the technology as it is. I mean, slight changes in the velocity models can make a difference. Slight changes in the petrophysical an, uh, analysis is done. Uh, I'm very concerned about where are we going to find experts to do the auditing lane when at the, today's marketplace, we can't find enough people to actually explore for and produce the reserves that we're trying to manage today. Well, it, it's a choice, and the question is, you know, does it need to be mandated, or is this some, something that, uh, you know, someone would take on because they want to establish, if you will, a higher level of credibility? Today, mm -hmm. most of that occurs by the smaller companies. You don't find the large companies uh, doing it, but I think it's a matter of choice. How much does it cost companies to comply with SOX? First, let's hear from Matt Simmons. It costs, it costs the industry an awful lot to comply with with, with, with in. On the audit committees, I'm on two-thirds of the time of the audit committee, which is now stretched into being one of the longest time consumers, is going through a checklist of irrelevant things so that they can have a checklist to say, oh, now we're, we're Sarbanes Oxley compliance. I, was, I got an email from a, a, from a training company that said, congratulations, Mr. Simmons, since you're on the board of the publicly traded company Brown Foreman, we will allow you to attend one of three seminars on proper co corporate board management so that your company doesn't get fined by ISIS that your board is uninformed. And I got back to him and said, thanks, but no thanks. I've been, I've been on boards for 30 years. I've been advising boards for 30 years. And if, if, they, if basically me not attending that you know, gets Brown Foreman you know, bad marks, then that'll be, give me a fabulous reason to actually resign from the board and say, get me out of here. Sorbanes Oxley drove one of your good directors off this board. You know, there is a lot of cost. You asked the cost question. Um, AMR research um, forecasted last year, estimated last year, the overall cost of Sarbanes Oxley was something like $6 billion. And they think it's going to be about an equivalent amount this year. Yeah, the overall estimate they had for total compliance, governance, uh, and risk was somewhere in the neighborhood of about $30 billion. So the Sarbanes component itself is about 20% of the equation. And um, back on that issue, you know, it, it seems to me it's kind of questionable if it's really provided that much value. David? I want to um, respond to one thing that Matt had just said about uh, audit committees and, and, and their involvement in checklists. I've attended a lot of audit committees over the years. And a decade ago, I will tell you that when I attended audit committees, one of the primary things that I saw in a lot of companies is they were most worried about 
when their lunch was going to be and what hotel they were staying at and the evening's entertainment. Frankly, the audit committees that I attended, uh, frankly, were perfunctory at best, where no tough questions were ever asked during the course of an audit committee meeting. And I do think the pendulum has swung a little bit far, but frankly, you're seeing audit committee chairmen ask a lot tougher questions of management these days as a result of that. I sit on, I was the CFO of Shell Oil Company, I sit on a lot of audit boards and I agree as well. You know, the framework that's happening in an audit committee these days, that's a form of technology to a degree, the process side of how people do things. I think that's much improved. It's a little bit like environmental rules. When environmental rules originally got started, there was all kinds of legislation around it, all kinds of lawsuits and things of that nature, and I don't think you know, it was all as effective as it could have been. But you look today and we're in a whole new environmental regime. In my view, some of that's going to happen here in terms of the corporate governance side of things. I've not dealt with any uh, audit committees that I didn't think were really <laughs> professional and focused, uh, and our entertainment would have been getting out of there in order to get home to see our family. So I would appreciate it if we were a lot more efficient. Um, from a technology perspective, uh, you know, I, I can't really comment. I don't, I'm a little like Matt. I sort of raise my eyes and go, I don't know what that means. Um, I think it's complicated, though, as we begin to look at... Uh, the exchange is talking about merging as to whether or not uh, we're going to have a globalization of these types of processes and compliance measures. Um, at the moment, I would say that U.S. companies are disadvantaged compared to international companies because of Sarbanes-Oxley, and it's encouraging companies to potentially incorporate outside the United States. But we complicate that picture by the potential globalization of the exchanges, and I'm not really sure as to what the, the long-term picture will be with regard to harmonization of them between Europe and the, the U.S. or how that's going to evolve. Well, we know that image is everything. That was a common American catchphrase before Enron. When we return, what are the energy industry's vital signs in this post-Enron world? We'll get out the thermometers and tackle that topic. Stay with us. You're watching World Energy Television. <laughs>